Hey, good morning, church. How's everybody doing this morning? Let's get on our feet. Welcome online if you're with us at home. Uh, we're going to sing some songs to the Lord this morning and worship Him. Uh, so feel free to join in with your voices, with your hands, with your feet, uh, whatever feels good to you. But let's sing out loud and sing worship to our Father this morning.
sing praises and I sing praises to Amen. Thanks so much, guys. You can have a seat for just a few moments. Hey, good morning, everybody. It's great to see you. Welcome. Welcome to all of you. Welcome to all of you guys here, all of you watching online. And uh, we're off to a new year. We're like almost halfway through the first month of the year, which is crazy. It's just flying by already. And uh, we just want to say a really, really warm welcome to you guys. And hey, this month, what this month is all about is we're shifting, uh, as most of you looking around, and most of you guys have uh, heard most of this before, those of you watching online, one of the biggest deals about our church is getting people into small groups, 
And uh, we're going to do that this, this semester either way. We're going to move forward online or we're going to move forward in person. But the value is getting people together in relationship because that's where you really grow. That's where you, you get to be known. That's where you get to express your concerns, where you get to dive into God's word. And we want that for every person here. Um, in fact, these, these two guys that are serving with me, they were in our small group, and our families grew so close over that semester, and it really came from being in a small group together. And we want that for every person here and every person watching online. So what the action step is is that next week you can start signing up for small groups. Our leaders are gathering together today online, and uh, we, we don't know what's going to happen with schools and COVID and all the things. We, we don't know. And, but the truth is, is that we know that we're called to be together. We know that we grow together. We're not going to let fear overwhelm us, and we're going to be together in community. And so this is how we're going to do it is through these small groups. So we really, really implore you to take the time to sign up for a group. I know you're all busy. I'm busy. We're all busy. There's a million excuses why not to do this. But this really, really is one of those things of taking care of yourself, taking care of your soul, reaching out for, for, to other people to help them grow as well, and it's going to be amazing. So you can sign up for those starting next week. Uh, lastly, um, if you came prepared to give an offering, you can give that on the way out in the boxes. You can give online like my family and I do. But we just want to say thank you so much for your generosity. And I just want to tell you, just to be real honest, we don't take it for granted. We are so grateful for how you guys have served and given and your generosity over the years. And we're so, so grateful. So thank you. Uh, we don't expect that or, or just um, assume it's going to happen. We're, we're really grateful. So thank you for your, your faithfulness. Um, Pastor Greg is going to come and lead us in community, and we're going to celebrate that together. Thank you, Pastor Archie. Um, if you have your communion cup uh, packaged nicely for us, for our safety, um, the, uh, the top is a little uh, transparent uh, plastic. If you lift that up, then that exposes the bread, and then underneath that is a little tin foil. Um, if you lift that up, then that exposes the, uh, the, 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 the juice. And so I just want, um, so if you need to fidget with it, you can as we begin. Um, I want to share with you from uh, Matthew chapter 26. This is uh, just on the eve of Christ's passion, or what they call the, the death of Christ. Um, and he's meeting up in the upper room with his disciples for one last uh, meal. And this is the time where uh, Jesus announces uh, what the purpose of his body and the purpose of his blood is. And what he explains to them is that, and the part that I want to emphasize today, is that the blood represents the forgiveness of sins. Very important in the life of the Christian is the continuing forgiveness of sins that we experience because of the blood of Jesus. Um, the communion is a time where we are drawn to Jesus. We cannot approach Jesus without moving away from sin. When you come to Jesus, it's impossible to bring your sin with you. So when we come to Jesus, our sin moves away from us because of his blood and because of the forgiveness that we experience in Jesus. And so this is what Jesus shared with them. Verses 26 through 29 of Matthew 26. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew new with you in my Father's kingdom. Let us take the bread. And as we approach the Lord's Supper today, let us recognize the forgiveness of sins that we have through Jesus and let us be grateful.
Let us take and let us eat this bread where it represents his body, which represents our sustenance in Jesus. Let us eat this and be thankful. Let us take the juice. This juice represents the blood of Jesus. It was the blood of Jesus that was shed that affected our forgiveness of sins that we have. Let us take and let us drink this. The life of Jesus and our life were now and all of eternity. And let us be grateful. Let us close as the Lord taught us to pray. Let us pray together. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Father, we thank you that you are our champion. And I pray over the next few moments as our pastor comes to speak, that your words will speak through him and our ears will be ready to hear him. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Nina, Aaron, and, and um, Ami and Joe and Archie leading us so well into worship. I um, invite you to turn in your Bibles or click on your phones, whatever you might have to our passage that we're going to focus on today and Isaiah chapter 61 and we're going to look at verses 1 through 4. Um, sometimes people don't notice but sometimes there are people who do notice that I rarely preach out of the Old Testament and uh, so this would be one of those times. I think it's it's a pretty rare one but here we go and I think I'm going to preach out of the Old Testament for the rest of uh, uh, January certainly why? Because I feel culturally that we are in a very unsettled time. And I think a lot of people feel that they are on the brink of a great change in our nation and in our world. We're just waiting for the ball to drop, so to speak. And we're just wondering, what's it going to be like? It's not an optimistic feel that I personally have from people. It's a pessimistic view that we're going to go through a, a quite a dramatic transformation. This is very common throughout history. Sometimes when I hear people say, oh, this is the worst, you know, that we've ever had it in America. This is the worst. And I'm thinking, you haven't really lived anywhere else, have you? <laughs> because in America, sometimes our very worst days are still a thousand times better than 90% of the world's best days. And so I, I try to, to just see a bigger perspective, a, a more, perhaps a more historical uh, perspective to it. And I think regardless, in the big picture and all it is, it does call us back to God. It is still a time that should trigger a reminder of who God is and who we are as his people and the confidence and the knowledge that as we sang earlier today, the battle belongs to the Lord. I think if there was one thing, if I could as a pastor wave a magic wand and change about the church of Jesus Christ, I think that would be it, that we would recognize that it is God who sets the course. It is God's guidance and that God is taking care of us, that it will not be our political ideas, that it will not be our, our, our passions or our fervency that will change the world, it will be God. And our attention should not be on ourselves, but our attention should be solely focused on who God is and what God is doing and what God is calling you and me to step out into. What does it mean for me to partner with what God is doing in the world? I feel that is, if, that, if we could ever get that down, where we don't have to think that we have got to come up with a solution, that God already has the solution, and that what we can do is rest in his solution and do the things that he gives us in the moment to do. I think sometimes we're frustrated because the things he gives us in the moment to do are not grandiose things. They're not life-changing or culture-changing or nation-changing things. They can be as simple as... How about being a little bit nicer to your spouse? How about, how about being more concerned about your kid's future than you are about how they, you know, living vicariously through them? How about reaching out to that neighbor who you haven't spoken to, you haven't taken the chance to go? I think sometimes those are things that God calls us to do, which goes right along with our sermon series for the month of January that everything big starts small. And many times we resist the small, we don't like the small, because we don't feel that it is, we are worthy of investing in the small, that we should be doing bigger things. But the Bible continually tells us that big things do not happen outside of the small. And the one thing that I wanna direct your minds to today is the small, it's not small, but all of us see it as small, and that is sin. The sin in our lives, the sin, the hopelessness that sin causes. And so as I share this passage about Isaiah and what the purpose of it is, in the back of your minds as we approach this, I want us to all to consider as, as a church family, as, as brothers and sisters in Christ, the importance of recognizing sin and the importance of uh, uh, admitting it and putting it back to Jesus. There is no hope for humanity 
outside of salvation, outside of forgiveness of sin, outside of a restored humanity in the image of Christ. That's what prevents everything from getting better is sin. And out when, but when sin is forgiven, it's amazing how great things are God is able to do. So that is, that is the essence of what I want to share with you. Sometimes people come to this passage, it's very well known. Uh, a lot of people, if you spend any time at all in a church pew, you have learned or heard this passage. It's very uh, familiar. The Lord, uh, the sovereign Lord, the Spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. He's anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim. Da, 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 da. We've heard that. And a lot of times we think, this is Isaiah, he's describing what happened in his time. What he's, he's given a like historical account of, of people that have uh, come back from exile and are rebuilding Jerusalem again. Nay, 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 nay. <laughs> that is not at all what is happening. What you are doing is you are reading a prophecy of what will still be to happen. Isaiah never lived through this. The Lord put it on Isaiah's heart and revealed to him, this is what will happen way down the road. In Isaiah's case, it was to happen repeatedly. The first time it was to happen about 120 years later after Isaiah passed away. I don't know if you guys remember, but I think it was pretty much the close to last Sunday that we had um, uh, after uh, Christmas, uh, probably Christmas Sunday, uh, the one before Christmas, and we talked about that uh, prophecy where um, the little boy uh, was be given a, a little a young girl would give birth to a boy. His name will be Emmanuel, and the historical story of there, same thing with Isaiah. Um, it was saying, well, as long as this little boy lives, that is to be a sign to you that the Assyrians will not invade Jerusalem, not invade the southern kingdom, Judah. And so that's, that's in this whole picture right here. That whole idea takes place along with this. But what Isaiah went on to prophesy by a little, about 50 chapters later, he said, but even in Jerusalem, even in the southern kingdom, at some point, you guys are not going in the right direction and it's going to catch up to you. What he said was, the Babylonians are going to come in. It won't be the Assyrians. The Assyrians, like God said, will not invade you. They will not destroy you, but the Babylonians will. For the very reason is that you guys have forgotten to, uh, to keep God first in your lives. You guys have forgotten the relationship that you have with God and you have allowed other gods, other religions, and you have been distracted from the priorities and from the worship of the one true God by the worship and the priorities of the many. And his point was, it will happen. And the Babylonians will come in and they will devastate Jerusalem. And you will all be thrown into exile. And everything that you see, all of your land, all of your community, all of your family structures will all be devastated and gone. And you will be sent thousands of miles away. And of course, that's pretty harsh uh, prophecy. <laughs> and the people, you know... Uh, he, they started to wonder about Isaiah. He came back to say, but all is not lost with God. Even though you might have lost your land, you have not lost your relationship with God. And if you will renew your relationship with God, God will restore your land in that day. And that's what a prophet Isaiah was telling people. Way out in the future, the details are shockingly accurate to history. It's just, honestly, you don't even know, am I reading a prophecy or am I reading a historical account? Because the historical account overlays the prophecy so minutely and so picture perfect in such detail, it's hard to know which are you reading. And that is consistently prophecy in scriptures, but certainly in this passage here, it's, it's just, is it history or is it prophecy? It's hard to tell. And Jesus picks up on this. Jesus was not the first audience. The first audience to hear this, this prophecy about them would have been the exiles coming back from Babylon along with Ezra and Nehemiah and that whole story about rebuilding the walls. It would have been those early Jews coming back. They would have said, <gasps> look at Isaiah was talking about us. Here we are. Here we are facing this completely ruined city with little hope or little help to, to ever rebuild this thing. I don't know what we're doing out here. That would have been them. But let's fast forward all the way up to Jesus. Jesus himself, when he decided it's time for me to start my ministry, 
he went to his local synagogue, as is his custom, was his custom, and he went in and asked for the scroll to be given to him, and he read from this very passage. And for Jesus, it was not only about a prophecy that Isaiah was making, not only was it the experience that the, that the Jews would experience in coming back from Babylon, but it was for Jesus in this very day, in his very day. He said, this is what God will do. Well, before I get too much further down the line here, let's go ahead and read what Jesus read to those people, but let's go back to the, the very first words of Isaiah, which Jesus read. And here we are, um, Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 4. This is what um, Jesus read. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. And Jesus' comment right after this is that this prophecy is fulfilled in your hearing. And Jesus is saying, here you go. But it's a, a refulfilling, if you will. And it is a refulfilling not only in the time of Jesus, but also a refulfilling in the day of Christianity around the world on a continual basis. It is a refulfilling of the purpose and the reason that we exist as a family, as a church family, as we exist as the kingdom of God in this world. I just want to add something, a little bit of trivia to this. To me, it was so fascinating. When Jesus read out of this passage of Isaiah, a lot of times we think that the Bible has gone so many changes, so many uh, redactions of it, and we've lost it. Written. No, we haven't lost the original meaning. It is exactly as it was written. The consistency is amazing because every once in a while, archaeology gives us uh, an insight that you could never have otherwise. And about 100 years before this incident with Jesus, there was a group, a community, kind of uh, more on the outskirts of Jerusalem, kind of a solitary kind of community, were busy copying the scriptures for future generations. And during the siege of Jerusalem by the Romans, these people hid these passages in caves just south of, his, south of, of Jerusalem, in an area called Qumran Caves. That's where uh, the... Uh, that the, the big fortress where the Mossad do their, their ritual every, every year, to, their allegiance. Um, and, and, and in those caves around that area, it was, I don't know, about sometime in the 50s, um, a little shepherd boy in that area, 50s like just a few, you know, a few decades ago, um, threw a rock into a cave and heard pottery shatter. And he went in there and found all these shards and scraps and, and uh, scrolls ancient, ancient scrolls, and these were them. These were them. And the passage of Isaiah 61 is one of the most intact of all of them. And the words are exact as it has come to us. Exact. So this is even 100 years before Jesus, and the words are exact. And every time that archaeology finds something, the consistency and the faithfulness of the literalness of what was written before has come to us almost in a divine way. And so when you read your scriptures, you can have so much confidence. All right, sorry I took so much time to explain that, but I just thought that was fascinating. We come to the point here with ourselves and with Jesus. With Jesus, well, let me go back a little bit, back to the time of, of uh, the, the, the first exiles who had returned from Babylon. When they arrived, they were completely disheartened because of the devastation of Jerusalem. When the Babylonians raised the city, they had no intention of rebuilding the city. They raised it for it to be gone from history forever. 
And yet now this group of people, ragtag team of exiles come in with not enough resources, with uh, enemies still attacking them, groups of people that got used to live in the area without these, these Babylonians as they would be thought of coming in. And they said, this is a really hard job. This is impossible to rebuild these walls. And where did they start? They started by bringing in Ezra, and they started by bringing in Nehemiah. And what did those guys do? They did not start by building, digging the foundations. They did not start by hewing stones. They did not start by the architects. They started at the beginning. They started by confessing their sin. They started by realizing why they had lost what they lost and the reason that they had been exiled, reason that they weren't in Babylon, that they had gone to Babylon. It was because of their sin against God, that they had disregarded God and forgotten God. It was because that during their day, they had thought that politics was going to be a solution for a better future. They had thought that money was going to be a solution to a better future. And their concern was all about their own power. And they invested in it to the disregard of God and who God was. Isn't that a hilarious story that we just keep reliving over and over and over? And even in your day, in my own day today, and in newspapers around the world, it's about what? It's about how people are getting together and trying to make rules, trying to make communities, trying to, to create a system and of justice, trying to create a system of laws where a city, where a nation, where a society can improve itself. I would like to see the first law that is written that prevents corruption. Where's that law? I'd like to see the first law that is written or legislation that comes through that, that pr prohibits people from taking advantage of other people. I'd like to see a lawmaker come up with a law or a system of any type that, that prevents somebody from accumulating more for themselves than they are stewarded, expected to give to others and how they are to manage the, the wealth of the nation. I'd like to see a law like that. Why don't we see that? Aren't we sophisticated? I thought our nation had the best universities. I thought we had the, the very best of philosophers. I thought we had people that have amazing doctorates in education. Why can't they come up with a simple statement or simple law to create a government that, that doesn't steal from its own people? Where's that? Because there is no such thing. And while we keep trusting in laws, we keep trusting in governments, keep trusting in society, it keeps con continually being undermined by the, the sinfulness and the self-centeredness of everybody, of everybody. Where is the solution to that? I'll tell you where the solution is to that. It is when a human being comes before God and they see themselves or who they are filled with sin, filled with hopelessness, filled with despair, and they stand before God and say, there is no hope outside of you, God. I cannot rid myself of the sin. I cannot rid myself of the self-centeredness that I have in my heart. I cannot rid myself of this desire to gain more uh, than, than others. I cannot get myself outside of this world being all about me and what I can accumulate in my little short lifespan, meaningless lifespan. I can't get beyond that. And it's only in Jesus that there's, any ever, that there's ever any hope that a human being could be more concerned about others than they care certain about themselves. It's only in Jesus. It is only in Jesus. There's no political system. There is no philosophy. There's no approach. In fact, there's nobody even saying they can do that. They don't even claim to do that. They just try to ignore it or, or overwhelm it or whatever. But it's the Bible and it's the gospel that gets right to the heart of the issue, the core of the issue. The issue at hand is sin. And that's what Ezra realized in Nehemiah. And when you read Ezra and you get to chapter 9 and chapter 10, what you see is they began to rebuild a city. How? By repenting of their sins, of confessing with their sins on a national level. And it was when they had gone back to their past, that small little past that none of us like to think about, when they had gone back to their past and made their lives right before God, when they confessed their sins before God as a nation, and they said, we are, we are seeking forgiveness and we are repenting from the way things have been done. Only then were they able to step out into a future that was going to be different than their past. You cannot have a future 
different than your past if you are stuck in the sin of your past. It is a joke. Oh, 2022 is going to be so different. Tell me how different it's going to be. Because if you continue in the same sins as you did in 2021, I'm going to guess that 2022 is right there looking a whole lot like 2021. Because your sins have a way of holding you back. And not just for a year. Let's try thousands of years. They hold you back. They hold you back. And even as individuals, as much as we would like to change, what do we do? We read all these books. We listen to podcasts. Oh, this next year is going to be different. I'm going to make resolutions. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Oh, yeah, go do all that and find that you're still stuck in the same sins that you were, that were holding you back. The only hope that any of us have as an individual, as a family, as a church, as a nation is what? To go back to our past and deal with the reality of our sin. That's the hope. If we can break free from that sin, if God, by his grace, can help us repent from that and see that the future cannot have that sin in it, and we, we, we depend upon the Lord to free us from that, then our future is secure in God. Then we can become the people. We can become the nation. We can become the society that God has given us. I remember when I was, when I was in college, I, I studied business and finance, and I remember going on a trip to Brazil, a mission trip to Brazil. And I remember uh, in my head, I just could not get the idea of how Brazil could get past its miserable situation. Back then it was called the sleeping giant. And it just had the potential for so much wealth. But yet it couldn't get past. Why? Because of corruption. And I kept thinking of all these, all they got to do is, is fix this. All they got to do is do that. And I remember explaining that to a missionary. And he says, oh, Greg, he says, they're not going to get past any of that until they give their hearts to Jesus. And the Lord changes their hearts and they live for him. And you know what my response to that was? <laughs> no, 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 theories can change. Economic systems can change. We can implement these new systems, these new structures and all that. Guess where Brazil's at today? Guess where Venezuela is at today? Guess where every country in Africa is at today? Guess where the United States is at today? Dealing with the same problems, the same thing, same structure, same everything. If anything, it's just getting a little bit worse. If anything. It's that same issue. It's that sin. And I know that it's not very sophisticated of us to say the issue is a sin problem. But guess what? It's a pretty honest thing to say. It's a pretty accurate thing to say it's a sin problem. When Jesus came and he announced this, what is he saying? He said, I have come for the forgiveness of sins. Just like in, in, um, in 1 John uh, chapter 1, verse 7, he says, if we have fellowship, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with the other. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. It is Jesus that removes the sin. It is Jesus that when we are, we are forgiven of our sins and we are able to get beyond our sins, then we are able to now become the new people that God has called us to be. That seems like a small thing, but you can't get beyond it. You can't get past it. There is no new day outside of dealing with the sin of our past. As I look at our own city, I drive in, it's just to me, it is unfathomable. The we, for one, it's unfathomable to me how we can have a county that has as much money as it does and still not have enough money to do the very basics of what it needs to do. I've lived in many counties around the United States that don't have a pittance of what Santa Clara County has, yet they are able to provide services that Santa Clara is not able to provide. I just how how is this possible? Not every county has Google, Yahoo, or Yahoo's not getting around anymore, any, Apple, all these really great companies all paying in. What county has has property values? Good luck finding a house for, for less than a million dollars, or now it's getting close to a million and a half dollars. And those are all property taxes based on percentages. I look at that and I'm just how is it that I drive by tent cities? How is that even possible? In what world is am I able to drive and see such poverty like this and such lack of services? I don't know. I just sit here, I just throw my hands up. I don't know. And to be honest, as I look over the cities, 
I'm devastated. I, I'm overwhelmed by the problems that exist. A lot of times I'll be out on our patio here at the church in the evenings. It's, it's just absolutely gorgeous to look out over our city and you can see down through the, the valley and the, the peninsula and the other cities that are come on on a clear night. And, and you look at all that. And there's something that happens inside of me. I begin to think of the arts. I begin to think of the educational institutions. I begin to think of the government. I begin to think of the society. And you know what's something I, I soon forget? The people. I just think in terms of conglomerate things, groups and things. I forget. But God doesn't forget. When God looks at the city, what does God see? Buildings? Organizations? No, he sees individuals. He sees one person, two people, three people. He sees people. He sees people. And what can change a city? What can change a city? What can reform a city? What hope do we have that here we are in the city that perhaps has the, the most opportunity, the most potential, yet is in my personal opinion, just absolutely wasting it all, and I would expect to be account held accountable for it someday. What hope can we have? I'll tell you what, we can have the hope of the gospel. We have the hope of Jesus changing the hearts of an individual, of an individual, of an individual. That is the hope. The reformation of a city, and I'm talking historically speaking over a span of thousands of years, is a deeply spiritual thing, a deeply spiritual thing. It has to take place by, by, with, with the, the, the work of the Spirit, the anointing of the Spirit. It has to take place with the Word of God, with the Word of God. It has to take place with people partnering with God and doing what God has given them to do. Whether they think that's big or they think it's small, regardless, it has to be what God has given me to do. That's how a reformation of a city takes place. That's where a church, a church family, not only our church, but all the churches combined in this area, where we come together, we become the people of God, the hope of this world. That's what we are. We are those people that, that Isaiah didn't even know he was writing about. We are those people that the audience heard Jesus say, you know, that, that he is the one who is uh, anointed. They didn't realize that in a far, far country, they didn't even know that geographically this part of the world existed. But yet here we are and we read these words and we see them and we understand that, yeah, that's me. That's about me. And it's about me being able to say, God, I am a sinful being. God, I, I try to justify my sins. I try to compare my sins to other people to be able to say, oh, it's not that bad. I, I try to do all these things, but Lord, and none of it ever works. Lord, help me to come before you and just admit the reality of who I am before you. To understand that whatever you reveal to me about my sin, honestly, is just a, a drop in the ocean compared to how much more there is. But thank you for your grace. Thank you for your peace. And help me, Lord, to be son of those rare people in the kingdom of God that is able to live out of concern for others rather than concern for himself. How can I live for others instead of concern for myself? Very simply, just like we sang before, the battle belongs to the Lord. You don't have to worry about yourself. God sees you. God cares about you. God has provided for you. There is not a day that you have to provide for yourself. God will see fit and he will provide what you need. Even in the problems that you are faced with, the problems that you are obsessed about, you're wasting your time. The only way for a Christian to confront the problems that God has given them is out of thanksgiving to God. Thank you, God, for providing the solution to this problem that I do not see. Lord, I, I trust in you, I depend upon you, and I thank you for taking care of these issues. There is no reason on earth for us to be concerned about ourselves because God is already concerned about us. Amen. The only thing we have to be concerned about is those who do not know Jesus, those who still need to know the Lord. Because until they come to know Jesus, there is not a good future in our city and there's not a good future for them personally. It is Jesus, the one that makes all the difference. This is a passage of great hope. It is a passage of great hope for you and for me. You don't have to think of a political system. You don't have to think how your favorite politicians are, are better than their favorite politicians. You don't have to think about why you're a good person and they're a bad person. What a waste of time all that is. <laughs> they're all bad. We're all bad. All we have to think about is how Jesus Christ changes this world, how he changes the heart of an individual. 
I like 1 Thessalonians 5, 24, 25. May the God of peace sanctify you through and through your whole spirit, soul, mind, and body be kept blameless before the coming of our Lord. The one who calls you is faithful. And then how does it end? And he will do it. It is Jesus Christ. It is the work of God to transform the human heart. It is not our ideas. It is what God does. And it is our letting God be God in our relationships with other people that God is able to do his amazing work. It is here for us to look out into a very dark world and proclaim the darkness has been lifted. It is not our spot for God, for, to ask God, God, take me out of the darkness. <laughs> That's not our spot, although that is the prayer of many a Christian. No, the prayer of many of Christians should be, Lord, let me be the light in the darkness. We are in the darkness. Let me be a light. That light that the darkness does not overcome, but the light overcomes the darkness. Let us, as the church of Jesus Christ, as, as citizens of the kingdom of God, as the people of God, let us be the light in that darkness. May the city come to know the, the, the Christians and the people that belong to the kingdom of God, the people that follow Jesus. Look at them because there, there is light. There, there is hope that we would be called to be those people. That's what the world is looking for. That's what the world is hoping for. And when they look at us, may that be exactly what they see. May they see those people who, 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 who have replaced, who've been crowned the, the, with a crown of beauty instead of ashes, with, with an oil of joy instead of mourning, that have been with a garment of praise to God instead of a spirit of despair. May we be those people. May we be those people that the Bible talks about. Those are the people who are restoring the ancient ruins. We are those people who are rebuilding that, that, that city that has been devastated. We are those people who are, are renewing the, the, the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Those are us. We are not doing it for ourselves. We are doing it as members of the kingdom of God, as steps and as building blocks of the kingdom of God and what God is doing. I don't know what big way or small way. It's probably going to be a small way. But do not despise the small things, the importance of the small things, because it's in those small things that God does big things. And it's not us. It's not us. It's God that does it. It's God that does it. And let's partner with God and do the things that God has given us that we might be a blessing to this dark and dying world that we're in. There is still hope. There is still hope for this world. There's still hope for this county. There's still hope for this nation. There's still hope for this world. And our hope is in Jesus Christ, that he will remove the sin from our lives and his spirit will come in and he will do what he has, been, what he has said he will do and he will restore all things in his kingdom. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity we have to be here before you and to recognize our great need of you. Lord, I pray, as, as many of us have prayed in the past, that if there be one thing that we are scared to death of, may it be sin. Lord, help us to be aware of the sin in our lives. Help us to be aware of our compliance with it and our complicity with it. Help us to be aware, Lord, of thought processes that, that accept sin. Lord, help us to be aware of, uh, of things that we try to do to please others but are sinful and they and we, we make the choice to please other people instead of pleasing you. Lord, forgive us for that. Help us, Lord, to, to be aware of the things that hold each individual back, that hold societies back, that hold back a better future for children, a better hope for our grandchildren. Help us, Lord, to repent of all those things that, that we do today to damage and destroy future generations. Help us, Lord, to remember that it's in our relationship with you that good things happen. It's in our relationship and the forgiveness of sins that you take us from this place and set us in a safe place, a better place. Help us, Lord, to depend upon you. Help us to encourage each other in our small groups. Help us, Lord, to love each other. Help us, Lord, to, to see the people that come into our lives throughout this week, not as just merely coincidences, but as God encounters. Help us, Lord, to be the light that you have called us to be in darkness. Let us not be afraid of that, but step into that and knowing that with you, all things are possible. And the light always overcomes the darkness. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
this building, as they turn off the stream online, that that will be evident to them, that your spirit will embrace them throughout this week as they go forth into their daily lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for joining us online. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.